Muy buenos días. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for and welcome to the, an event by the Migration Policy Institute. We're very happy to have a, a great panel set up for you today when we're going to talk about expanding um, legal pathways for migration from Central America to Canada, Mexico, and Costa Rica. Um, we're going to start in here in a few moments. I just wanted to welcome you again. Um, we are first going to uh, ask you to, 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 to have a few housekeeping tasks. My name is Ariel Ruiz. I'm a policy analyst here at Migration Policy Institute, and I work with a great colleague, a great team of colleagues on Latin America issues. Uh, again, I want to welcome you to the Promising Alternatives to Regular Migration webinar, which is about expanding temporary worker programs in Canada, Mexico, and Costa Rica. Um, this webinar highlights a larger part of our work at MPI that looks at legal uh, employment pathways, and it's available in our website. The title, again, is Temporary Worker Programs in Canada, Mexico, and Costa Rica, Promising Pathways for Managing Central American Migration. Um, the report in itself actually comes in about in a conversation that we've had, not just with MPI, but I think across the United States and the region, and you last saw this at the Summit of the Americas last week, that essentially focused on how to improve legal pathways mechanisms for migrants from Central America and other parts of the, of the world to be able to find a place in Mexico, in Canada, or in Costa Rica as a way to uh, complement efforts that are happening in the United States. This report and this research is part of a, bar, a, a, a bigger um, project that we're working at MPI that's called Building on Regional Migration. Um, and it is expected for us to, for you to, and for us to be able to have some additional components that you'll be able to see in the future as well. So again, um, that's the, 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 the background for this. The last thing I'll say before I pass it on to my colleague, uh, Chris Ramon, is that the, this, this process really focuses on the larger perspective of how labor pathways can actually be one of the many different opportunities that these countries in the region have, and specifically coming after some of the Americas and some of the commitments that my colleague Chris will, will highlight in a moment, in a few moments, it is really important and timely to have this conversation, especially with so many uh, questions I'm sure many of you have, and as well as the 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 level and the quality of the dialogue that we'll have with our panelists, including the Minister of Labor and Social Welfare from Guatemala and uh, a CEO and co-founder of Cierto Global uh, that you'll hear from in a minute. I will introduce each of them at that time, but for now, I will uh, pass it over to my colleague, Chris. So again, thank you, Chris. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Adriel. Thank you to MPI for the opportunity to work on this amazing project um, and to be able to work with some amazing colleagues in a very timely report uh, that couldn't have come out at a better time. Um, so the, the purpose of this report um, is to kind of outline one component of an effective regional migration management system. Um, you know, a regional migration management system should be able to have humanitarian channels, but as Ariel noted, you also want to be able to have stable legal pathways for folks who can go work in countries in the region um, as a more effective way uh, to have an alternative to regular immigration. So um, this paper complements a piece that I wrote last fall on uh, the way that the United States can use its H2 program to create stable legal pathways for Central Americans. And this is the successor to that, to be able to look at it from a regional perspective. Um, you know, the, the, the report finds that, you know, in Canada, Costa Rica, Mexico, they have temporary work programs um, of varying degrees of maturity to bring in Central American migrants, um, but with the right adjustments, can become uh, a really good way for these individuals to come into these countries to fill labor needs and to create uh, alternative pathways to regular immigration. The key thing though, though is, is to note is that uh, these programs certainly do need uh, refinement and modifications to ensure that they're able to work uh, the most effectively possible to be able to create stable and safe legal pathways uh, for Central American nationals. Uh, so next slide. So the first country that we looked at was Canada. And the way we thought about Canada is that it is a mature pathway with some persistent challenges. Um, you know, the, the Canadian system uh, within the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, which is the broad uh, temporary program within the Canadian immigration system to bring in temporary workers, does have some agricultural programs that are relevant. Um, one that's worth mentioning is the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, which is primarily uh, based on bilateral treaties with Mexico and Caribbean countries. Um, that's not targeted at Central Americans, 
But it is important to note because this started in the 1970s. I believe the Mexican agreement was signed in 1974. So that should give you a sense of the longevity of the Canadian government's involvement in bringing temporary workers from Latin America to work in, in, in the agricultural industry. But what I think is more relevant are the agricultural streams and the low-wage streams in, in the agricultural program for the temporary foreign worker program that allow Canadian employers to bring in uh, individuals from all around the world to be uh, able to meet uh, labor demands uh, in specific industries. Uh, so this is a chart that outlines uh, the number of um, temporary foreign worker uh, visas that were uh, issued in the agricultural uh, streams. And as you can see there, obviously Mexico is uh, the largest group, and that's largely because of the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. But what's of particular interest is that uh, Guatemala in particular has been a sizable source of, uh, of, of uh, temporary migrants. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that the Guatemalan government is and has done a lot of referral uh, work through um, a program that it, it is able to locate and vet individuals to work in Canada and in the United States, and we covered that in the last report, uh, but that there is a robust way of trying to bring in more individuals to work in Canada based by the Guatemalan government, and we'll hear about that later. Um, the Honduran government also has a similar program, uh, and obviously the numbers aren't there for you know, in comparison to Guatemalan migrants, but it's still something worth uh, important to note. Next so slide. although Canada does have a mature program, um, the, there are some challenges. From the employer perspective, um, the federalist uh, model that the Canadian government has where uh, the federal government manages the temporary foreign worker program and the provinces actually are the ones who develop and enforce uh, labor and um, protections regimes means that for employers, they have to deal with duplicative processes in some instances uh, where a province is doing uh, the same process as the federal government is with temporary foreign workers. Uh, employers also express frustration that they have to uh, be able to fill out the, um, the, the labor market test to bring in temporary workers, the labor market impact assessment, um, and that makes it harder for them to retain empl uh, employees over the course of time. Uh, from the workers' rights perspectives, um, this program is sponsored, uh, the, the, an employer has to sponsor uh, a migrant and that leaves them open to potentially vulnerable situations where the, the, the worker may be reticent to report violations of labor law or um, immigration law uh, for fear of being terminated. Recruiters um, are also active in Central America, but uh, you do have bad actors who charge migrants uh, to be able to work in Canada, uh, which is you know, especially illegal, just like it is in the United States. That's a major issue. And I think the last thing is going back to this federalist model for labor enforcement um, in Canada, you create an inconsistent patchwork of different labor enforcement regimes, meaning that some in some provinces you get more strength and a little bit stronger enforcement and in others not as much. So those are the things to consider. Uh, next slide. So with Mexico, um, that this is a country that's really kind of moving much more towards a robust channel, um, which is sort of in the middle of the pack in this report. Um, the key vehicle here is the border worker visa, the Tarjeta de Visitante Trabajador Fronterizo, or TVTF, uh, which has been the center of Mexico's migration uh, pathway. Um, this is important because it allows Guatemalan and Belizean migrants with a valid employment um, offer to be able to work for one year in some key important Mexican states along the Mexico-Guatemala border. Um, most of these individuals are Guatemalan nationals, um, and they primarily work in agriculture and livestock industries in Mexico, followed by construction and trade and domestic services. Um, if you notice, these are the number of uh, TVTF visas that have been issued. It has been dropping off in recent years. Part of that's due to COVID and the economic downturn related to that uh, and border closures that made it harder for individuals to arrive. Um, some of it's due to, um, you know, basically migrants realizing they might be able to get a higher salary wage in other parts of Mexico. So they move to that part of the country to be able to work. Um, and part of it is there are some issues where uh, the number of women um, who are able to enter and work in these industries aren't really well represented. 
um, just because uh, you know women in part are part of uh, industries that where where they're concentrated, but may not be able to access uh, these visas. So that's there's a gender parity issue there as well. Um, in terms of like key issues um, to improve the program, uh, you know, obviously focusing on Mexican states along the Guatemalan border may not reflect where labor demands are or where uh, migrants would want to move to. Um, right now, the, the most obvious thing is Guatemala and Belize and uh, nationals are the only ones who are able to apply, even though that there was an agreement uh, to extend eligibility to Salvadoran and Hondurans in 2019. There is a points-based system that was written to law in 2011 that is far broader to bring in foreign workers, but uh, it hasn't been implemented uh, or operationalized in any way. So that's a potential thing to try for the future for these labor pathways. Now, Costa Rica is the last um, country in this report. Um, and they're the ones that um, are probably have the longest way to go in order to develop a more mature program, but that's not to say that they aren't doing some interesting things. Um, so in terms of their pathway, um, their 2010, 2010 migration law created four broad categories. There's one within this called the special categories that allows migrants to serve as cross-border workers, temporary workers, or workers in a specific occupation. And what's important here is a special category of workers can hold jobs um, you know, in, in, in economic sectors that are determined to be available for foreign workers, um, which is determined by uh, the Costa Rican government. So that's something too important to note is that the Costa Rican government uh, does sort of play a major role in determining where individuals work uh, uh, from year to year to year. Uh, now, in terms of you know, who's receiving, who's able to work in this pathway, or who has, Nicaraguan migrants have been uh, disproportionately the largest group. Um, that's that's really the, the key thing here is that uh, Nicaraguan migrants are, are, are an important key constituency. Um, but you are seeing other uh, increases in other Central American nationalities between 2018 and 20, 2019, which does suggest that there might be some demand and interest from Central American migrants. Um, and so that's something to uh, take a look for. Um, one important thing in terms of recent developments is that in 2020, the, the Costa Rican government did shut down um, access to specific labor markets uh, for foreign born workers, but they reversed that in April 2021 because a lot of the workers uh, who were working in specific industries, namely domestic work uh, by women, uh, were already in the country and the, and the country couldn't actually secure enough workers to be able to work there. So that's something that's worth noting. So what's of interest is that um, you know, Costa Rica did do something innovative where they signed an agreement with, um, with Nicaragua to be able to sort of bring in uh, larger numbers of Nicaraguan nationals to work in its agricultural industry. Um, you know, this is really important because there weren't any modifications to um, migration law writ large um, by uh, Nicaraguan legislators. And the protocol actually allowed for really effective management of migrant flows that you hadn't seen in other programs um, in recent years. So it was really good for tracking migrants, being able to ensure that they're actually getting some safety when it comes to COVID protocols, and ensuring that employers are able to work with the government to sort of determine where the needs are for improving the management of workers. So this is something that I think is very much worth keeping in track of. Some of the Americas. So I'm sure a lot of folks are wondering uh, what happened last week. And, and this is a quick top line of sort of the three things uh, that are relevant to this report um, that you can see there. I think the key thing to take away from this is that, um, you know, it's, it's fantastic to see that this was a priority item for the discussions on migration policy. Um, and that this is a very good start uh, towards at least having a much more robust regional response. Um, I think that this is just a fine and a really good development. Um, and the question, of course, is how this is all going to be implemented and the accountability to ensure that this is being met. So those are some issues that are going to be worth tracking uh, forward. Uh, next, so quick policy recommendations based on, you know, obviously this great news. Um, you know, for Canada, um, the Seasonal Agricultural Work Program is actually a very well-managed program, it has regular annual meetings um, between uh, relevant governments and stakeholders. And so I think if you can do that to apply that to other temporary foreign worker programs, that really would be a much better way of ensuring that there are some of these safety and employer needs um, being met for employers and for migrant workers.
Um, creating a multi-year temporary foreign worker visa that allows uh, Canadian employers to retain the same worker without necessarily submitting an ML, uh, uh, you know, market labor market test is something else to consider. Um, you know, obviously you can still have labor market tests or at least minor ones being there, but you don't want to go through the full process. And obviously investing in a trusted employer and recruitment program for, uh, for migrants is key. And uh, one of our panelists will dive into that a little bit more. Mexico, it's really all about um, ensuring that the government can map out where the demand for uh, foreign-born workers um, are, it, you know, are located in, in the country um, to basically inform the future direction of its um, work-based programs. Uh, the, the, I think the more obvious step is just for the TVTF is extending eligibility to other Central American countries and nationals um, and you know, expand the program to other parts of Mexico and ensure that you are seeing that there are ways for um, gender parity to allow, that allows women to be able to work in higher numbers uh, in this program. And that is a, not an issue just simply uh, for Mexico. We actually covered a little bit of this in the US report as well. So this is a persistent issue with temporary foreign worker programs. Um, you know, I think with, uh, you know, the, this protocol that I described in the process the, to, to be able to manage immigrants, um, you know, extend this to, um, you know, uh, the three Northern Central American uh, my, uh, countries to be able to improve the ability for them to be able to work and to be able to meet uh, the leave for, for foreign born workers, um, you know, be able to create some pathways for permanent residency for these individuals so they have more portability, um, which is another thing that I think should be considered more broadly within Canada and Mexico. Um, and ensure that this private part, uh, private public partnership that I mentioned uh, in the protocol continues forward for just managing uh, migration flows writ large, but especially for um, work-based channels like the ones I described. Um, so those are the key recommendations and I'll turn it back to Adriel. Thank you, Chris. And, and I think uh, um, one of the key things that our, our co-authors as well, uh, Maria Jesus Mora and Ana Martin Gil, Chris and I were thinking through this report as we were as we were making the research and interviewing uh, different set of stakeholders was how do we think about implementation and expansion of these programs in a way that's uh, that includes ethical recruitment that focuses on maybe some of the shortcomings but also opportunities in doing so and to answer some of those questions and really open up the conversation for I'm sure many of your questions as well in the audience we have first a, a, a great resource of information, specifically thankful and grateful for Minister Rafael Rodriguez uh, to join us from Guatemala City today. Um, he is again, the Minister of Labor and Social Welfare. He uh, follows very closely expansion routes to the United States and to other countries in terms of legal pathways for Guatemala. And uh, we are very thankful again to have him here with us. Uh, Minister, to 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 get started with your remarks, the questions I guess that 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 came to to our attention as we were writing the report is, um, Guatemala has a lot of migrants that are increasing numbers in labor pathways to the United States, such as H two A program. But if we can think about beyond the United States, what are some of the important challenges and opportunities that the Ministry of Labor faces in placing migrants, uh, Guatemalan migrants, in Canada and other Mexican programs? Um, what about the late the Los Angeles Declaration that came out last week? Uh, on Friday, would there be anything particular that you see as helpful in the short-term efforts to to help expand this ex to help uh, efforts to expand uh, these programs? And then finally, what are your expectations of the new Guatemalan law that uh, could come to fruition on promoting the temporary labor program abroad? So again, thank you, Minister. Uh, please take it away. Gracias, Ariel, y gracias al... Thank you, Ariel, and thank you to, for, to the Institute for this invitation for having me here to share these thoughts with you and especially with my fellow panelists. Very interesting to hear the presentation and to see uh, the report that Cristobal Ramon presented. So on behalf of the Guatemalan government, first, I would like to start by clarifying, like President Yamate has said that as a country, what we're more interested in is creating pathways to prosperity so that people don't migrate or rather that they migrate by choice as an option, not out of necessity, if there really is a better opportunity somewhere else. But the first recourse would be to stay in Guatemala. So according to census data and uh, population growth projections, about 3 million Guatemalans between 
those who have already been born abroad among the children of immigrants and Guatemalans who have currently migrated. That is who makes up the population of migrant workers. Many of them and the majority of them have irregular status in terms of immigration. And so that behoves us as a government to look for programs like the H2 programs in the US to foster orderly, safe migration and so that there can be a family reunification as well. So to not break up families, which happens when people migrate through irregular channels. We have great challenges in Guatemala in terms of the labor market, because there are more people joining the labor market every year than jobs being created. And so this entails the need to look for options. And the ones that you have mentioned are some of those and some of the most valuable among them. We would look to facilitate this regular migration in the case of Canada, and that was the first question, and Mexico, that's where we have seen more regular migration. And so what am I talking about in terms of Canada and the figures referred to at the beginning mentioned this, we see that a large part of the labor market of among people, immigrants arriving every year are Guatemalan and Canada. This is something that's been happening very organically. And we would like to see this grow in a more planned manner. And so I'm going to circle back to another one of the questions. I think that in Canada, what we need to do is regularize these pathways so that we can have a clear accounting of who is migrating to be able to offer them support so that when they do it, they're able to do it with the support of their embassies through our foreign ministry and with full support of our immigration institute and our ministry of work to facilitate their work in Canada. That's a program that started about 10 years ago and it started with a very small group. And today we calculate that about 15,000 people are traveling to Canada annually. And as we have said, and as I was able to, um, or as our foreign ministry was able to share at the Summit of the Americas, speaking to his Canadian counterpart, that there is an opportunity to multiply these numbers, as we saw in the presentation. And so as a government, we have taken various steps to foster this, which is another one of the questions. Currently, our Congress just this month approved the, a law for fostering temporary foreign work or work abroad. Uh, our goal is to diminish uh, costs of travel by plane. And so this would create not only the possibility for Guatemalans to travel in greater numbers to Canada, but also to Europe if we diminish those travel costs. That's what we've been learning as we have been seeing here in the ministry as this program is growing. When President Yamate came into office, in our our ministry was beginning to uh, strengthen this labor mobility uh, program and only about 15 people left the country uh, to work through this program in 2021 916 people traveled and year to date just through may there have been over 1100 people participating in this program and we're hoping that by the end of the quarter that figure will be at about 1200 and that we will finish the year tripling our numbers from last year. And so that means that there is a real opportunity that is evidenced by the figures that if we grow these sorts of programs in the case of the US with H2B, or if Canada is motivated to receive more Canadian workers, these numbers can very easily reach our projections or our benchmarks um, to be able to serve those markets. In the case of Canada, there are some challenges that are what makes this a complicated task. The first is the issue of the language barrier. 
that applies both to Canada and the US. Uh, the job or the work background of the population that is traveling uh, from our country um, is challenging. And so we want to prepare them to have even a minimal command of the language that will allow them to really flourish there, which is harder in areas that are also French speaking, where French is the dominant language. And so that's created some obstacles, some challenges that we have defined very clearly and that we hope to surpass. And so what we've worked on as a ministry, and that's what we've worked on. And we've also looked to reduce costs that makes us more competitive. There are also uh, Mexicans who are continuing to travel. Uh, the primary beneficiaries of these programs, especially in the US and in the case of Europe, we would like to be more competitive in terms of our transportation costs for um, relative to migrants from North Africa. We know that there are many in Southern Spain, for example, um, in agriculture. And so as a government, we have done not only that, but there's been a package of proposals to foster orderly, regularized migration. And we have joined initiatives put forth by the ILO and that have been recently shared with or by the American government. And so, for example, in 2021, which was the second year of our administration, we formalized the structure and we institutionalized this program to give it all of the legal infrastructure it needed, as well as human resources, financial resources to be able to grow in a sustainable fashion and thus be able to allow more migrants to work abroad. And then as a part of this process or this project to strengthen the program, we have been aware of the need that exists within the jobs that are the hardest to fill. Uh, specifically dealing with uh, ocean trade. And so we are looking to increase the availability of workers for uh, for ocean trade. Uh, we would like to train workers to be able to work in this sector. And there's also a, a, a an agreement between governments uh, that looks to regularize the way that Guatemalans are recruited, recruited who would like to offer their services outside of the country. And so the goal of this regulation is to regulate private recruiters who are going to come to Guatemala, looking to establish themselves to facilitate the movement of people from Guatemala to host countries where they will work. So as we are sharing here today, and uh, our next speaker, Joe Martinez from Cierto Global, who are about to establish a presence in Guatemala, uh, there are companies, there are initiatives like Joe's as well as private companies. And since and so the government is aware of the situation and can monitor so that hiring is equitable through these bodies. So the ministry, on the one hand, can offer free services so that employers um, who want to take advantage of them can. And then there is a private sector for recruitment that as long as it follows all rules governing this activity, will be able to offer the opportunity to Guatemalans who wish to work abroad. So that's what we're continuing to work on. And we think that uh, being able to shorten the time to respond to a request from an employer abroad is very positive. Before, it took 54 days to respond to a request from an employer abroad. We've reduced that time to 21 days. And in terms of the agriculture sector in the US, we've been able to achieve an almost instantaneous turnaround. Before, it required 45 days of internal uh, work to issue that permit. So that's, that's what we've been doing to try to improve labor mobility, uh, to grow this program in a sustainable fashion 
and that will allow us to fill labor needs in these countries that need workers so that while we as a country are working toward absorbing all of the labor demand domestically from people who want to work um, so that in the meantime those people can have a suitable job outside of the country while we within the government or the foreign ministry are able to monitor what is going on abroad and so i will leave it at that uh, because i understand that there will be more discussion and so thank you thank you so much minister for your answer i think we will definitely have some questions for you after Joe's intervention. Before I go on to our next uh, panelist, I, I do want to remind our audience to please include your uh, questions into the questions and answers uh, function of Zoom. We will come back to those here in a few minutes after we hear from our next panelist. Again, please uh, either do that or send it to send the send your questions to events at migrationpolicy.org. I have uh, now the, the the great pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Joe Martinez, who is a co-founder and CEO of Cierto Global. And the minister, uh, Minister Rodriguez, was just talking about some of the new initiatives of trying to increase and better uh, understand and regulate some recruitment opportunities in Guatemala. Uh, Joe, I think one of the key things that, that we and, and many of us through the research thought about was, as we were uh, doing our findings is how do we promote uh, better uh, recruitment? How do we make these programs more efficient, not only in terms of time, but also in terms of the, the services that provide for migrants themselves? And so for, for your uh, intervention, I guess, uh, the, 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 the questions I have for you are, um, could you please tell us about, you know, your ongoing efforts on on making sure or informing migrants and equipping migrants to report abuses if you if you do follow that and then also um tell us a little bit about your your Guatemalan workforce initiative for h2o recruitment i know it's not for canada or costa rica or mexico but are there any lessons there that you think would be helpful uh to think about for the other countries and then um what uh specifically if you know something else other practices that, that you may be doing or working with Mexican, with Mexico, Mexico's government, if there's anything that you could translate for that as well. Finally, um, what do you think uh, are some of the ways that the government, civil society organizations, employer, employers can come together to improve these programs? What is the role of each of these in an ideal setting, of course, uh, to to make sure that we expand these programs responsibly? So again, uh, Joe Martinez from co-founder co and CEO of, of, of Cierto Global. Thank you for joining us. I'll pass it yes. over to you now. Well, first of all, thank you very much to the Migration Policy Institute for inviting me to be able to share some words. And um, on behalf of Cierto, we're just very honored to be able to work with the Biden-Harris administration, USAID, with the government of Guatemala, Minister Rodriguez, who we've been communicating thoroughly since its inception. And we're just um, very grateful that Cierto has been tasked to help expand legal pathways uh, from Northern Central America, specifically focusing on the H-2A visa. And I think I quickly want to just share with folks even though we've been focused on the H-2A visa, we also know that a lot of these legal pathways automatically intersect with Mexico, Canada, uh, and Cierto currently does do recruitment from Mexico, Guatemala to the United States. We're also focusing in Canada, and we're also recognizing that there's a huge need uh, for folks to receive Guatemalan workers in Mexico and are interested in exploring what those legal pathways can be and how can we improve programs to ensure that the region as a whole is benefiting from this focus on regional migration, but more specifically, ethical and responsible recruitment that I think is going to be the foundation and cornerstone to ensuring that these programs are done in a manner uh, that ensures workers' rights, workers' voice, at the same time protects the employer who is hiring these individuals and can demonstrate um, poverty alleviation, rural economic development, when done right, and when workers are taught and trained on how to exercise their rights and to come back safely to their friends and family. But one of the things that Cierto is uh, dedicated to is ethical and responsible recruitment. Since our inception in 2014, we have been working closely to figure out how to create a recruitment model that ensures workers are fully understanding their rights. Cierto is predicated on developing a community-based approach which means we need to be present within the communities of origin all the way from where the, where the worker steps out from their door. And so to do that, a part of this process is a little laborious, but Cierto predicates itself on not uh, subcontracting any part of its recruitment, which means that 
just as Seattle is present in the United States, we need to be present in Guatemala in the communities of origin. And the way that we're able to do that is by working with a network of local actors that we work with, which can be uh, social pastoral groups from the Catholic Church, various NGOs and uh, human rights organizations that have been present working in the communities. And the idea is that Cierto doesn't conduct an open recruitment. We collaborate and partner with local organizations that know the lay of the land, that know the families of these communities, so that when we conduct recruitment, we're able to fully understand the impact that the community is having. And in this process, we've also been able to develop a three-point uh, three verification system where through these partners that accompany us to observe our recruitment, they're able then to assess all the workers that attended our recruitment and ensure that none of them paid for the right to, to be at these meetings, no one's been coerced, no one's paying for the right to have access to an H-2A visa. And then at the same time, once we can uh, finish our recruitment process and workers have been dispatched to the job site, these local partners that know the family members that are hearing constantly from family conduct a second verification where they ensure that was the contract that Cierto shared actually true? Are you being able to exercise your grievances? Do you fully understand your pay stub, your contract and what's going on? And then last but not least, a third verification when workers return back home. And all of this is done with the purpose of trying to continuously improve recruitment and recognizing that we need to be able to help workers exercise their voice so that we can truly understand the ins and outs throughout the whole recruitment process. And so it's with that that we've been very um, pleased and honored to be able to receive funding to help expand the H-2A program by specifically 9,500 workers over the next few years from Guatemala to the U.S. Now, when I say that, that's a huge endeavor, right? We know that um, visa expansion is growing and it's moving forward. We've seen the H-2A program in the United States grow exponentially. But the reality is that there's a lot of abuses, just like the minister said it, and many of you have recognized. And so... I think when it comes to best practices, Cierto has always dedicated itself on building a model that is predicated on the international labor organization's general principles, and operational guidelines for fair recruitment. And I think just like Minister, uh, Minister Rodriguez shared, we're also very much encouraged um, by the United States federal government sharing their guidance on fair recruitment practices for temporary migrant workers that they shared last week at the Summit of the Americas. And so this uniquely positions Cierto in a place to not only demonstrate that we're in compliance, but be able to prove compliance above and beyond within the countries of origin, as well as the country of destination. And the key here is that that's really just the crux of the beginning to really create a model that ensures Brex practices, protects all of these migratory workers, as well as the employers that hire them and the supply chains that benefit from the products that end up going to the consumers that purchase these goods. Some of the best practices that I like to share and that I think are extremely important is um, they range from the first one that I'd share is our community impact. Cierto needs to know exactly what's happening when we enter into a community. It's not just the reality that we're going there to conduct recruitment, but I think one of the realities that we've seen in a lot of recruitment processes is that it's very transactional. And when you have a transactional process within the recruitment, uh, a recruitment model, you tend to have individuals that are just looking to make gains and therefore not fully understanding the whole impact of what their, their work is doing within the supply chain. And I think that this leaves a huge gap um, and we're missing an opportunity to demonstrate the value that workers bring overall to our global supply chains. Um, I think another reality is that this separates families. You know, just as the minister said, there's not that we want folks to migrate, we know that they need to. Um, the unfortunate need for economic opportunities expands all over these countries. And so how can we provide an honest and dignified way for these workers to be able to migrate that keeps their families informed, that keeps those local partners to be able to support these families in case anything happens. Knowing that we've been dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic, where a lot of workers have had to deal with a virus, uh, with knowledge around what could be the different symptoms and not knowing how things can happen. And it's that type of fear that Cierto aims to minimize. We really feel that it's through communication and strong channels of communication that we can really help folks fully understand what they're engaging and doing. Another focus for, for us is helping workers understand their value in the supply chain. If it isn't for them, they would not feed this world. And so it's important for us to be able to open channels to help recognize the, the expertise that these workers bring us. 
We also provide a training within the community of origin uh, that focuses on not only on workers' rights, but workers understanding all the various um, approaches and ways that they can break down different situations and problems, being able to help make continuous improvement processes and so many other things. Uh, but finally, I think it's also very important that we all recognize that no one organization can do this. Cierto sees that it's all based off of an ecosystem of organizations. And I'm extremely excited because over the course of the last decade that I've been working within this field of migration and migratory patterns, it's been exciting to see local governments, federal governments, and um, North America as a whole come together to realize that this migration isn't going away. And as we see in the United States, the H-2A program was created in the 80s as a last ditch effort to provide a labor supply for our agricultural field. But in reality, that's no longer the last option. It's the first option that we depend on to be able to fulfill our labor needs. And I believe our neighbors in Canada also recognize the same and Mexico is also starting to see this. So I think it's important that we start to focus on how can we work together. I really applaud uh, Guatemala, uh, Guatemala's administration in signing their new law 50-2022 that focuses on regulating recruitment within the country. I believe this is an important step in helping ensure the ethical and responsible recruitment of their Guatemalan nationals moving to any country. At the same time, I think it's the responsibility of recruiters and multiple NGOs and human rights organizations on how do we create mechanisms of oversight and share that information with federal governments so that we can continuously be having some sort of mechanism to engage one another, to be able to improve upon what we've built and be able to ensure that folks are being protected. I think ultimately what makes Cierto most successful is our ability to understand that we need to work with folks such as Minister Rodriguez, with the US federal government, with NGOs, the Catholic Church, human rights organizations, local organizations such as those 48 cantones in Guatemala that represent multiple indigenous communities, folks that truly know who the people that we're looking to serve and how we can impact them best. And it's bringing all those together that have allowed us, I think, to create a successful ethical and responsible recruitment model that is bringing value, not only to the workers within their communities of origin, but to federal governments, to employers, retailers, and supply chains overall. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. I think it's, uh, it's really good to hear from you some of the initiatives that I think a lot of uh, other um, um, employers have and another participants and stakeholders have been asking us for and it's it's great to see that you're you're beginning to open that area in, in Guatemala particularly um, again uh, I want to remind our audience we're now going to shift over to audience to, to questions and answers we have uh, about 15 minutes to do that I have some questions here already but please uh, if you have any more questions uh, put those on questions and answers uh, icon below in your zoom toolbar toolbar and or send us your e your questions to the following email events at migrationpolicy.org. Uh, you can also tweet your questions at um, hashtag migration, uh, migration policy or hashtag migration, um, migration uh, MPI discuss, excuse me, for that to be the case. So um, we're going to unmute our, 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 our panelists and I'm going to take some questions here uh, just to, to present that to, to some of you and then we can come back, of course, at the end to, to do a short conclusion. The first question I have here actually is for, I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Chris. Uh, Chris, in your presentation, one of the questions we have was if we have data on Salvadoran migrant workers and if they are included in, in any of the programs that we talked about, um, that could be one of the things that we could that we could shortly answer. And then I'll go right away to ask the foreign minister, the minister of a, of um, of labor and social welfare, uh, Minister Rodriguez. Um, we have some questions about uh, anything that the government, any initiatives that the Guatemalan government may be doing to expanding opportunities that that are multiple employer uh, driven, so not just with one employer. Essentially, portability, uh, if that's something that you guys have been looking at. And then second, though it's a question about uh, bilateral programs potentially with Belize. Um, I would like to go back and see if there's anything else you could like you you could add on on, on Mexico and the the work that Guatemalans working in Mexico, as I think uh, also Joe Joe mentioned. Um, and then we'll we'll leave it there for now, and then we'll come back to some questions for Joe. But um, so Chris, can you respond to the question on El Salvador, please? Yeah. So um, you know the the three you know, our team when we were looking at data uh, would have included El Salvador if if they were there in sufficient numbers. Um, 
it, they just simply weren't. Uh, you know, I was, for instance, I was the one who wrote the Canada report. Um, Salvadoran numbers were very, very low. Um, a lot of this is due to the fact that, um, you know, once you kind of begin creating virtuous cycles in terms of recruiting individuals uh, from one country, uh, you start seeing that employers actually start relying on these individuals and individuals that they may know um, to, to do this. So it's, it's one reason, for instance, um, that in the, in the U.S. H-2 programs, um, most of the workers are there from Mexico because you know, these are the individuals who came up, started working in the H-2A programs. And then when you said, okay, we need to bring in more individuals to recruit, um, who do you know when they asked, when the farmers asked the, the, the workers that, they said, oh, well, I know my cousin and so forth. Uh, those kind of network effects certainly do exist in the other programs. Um, so it's not to say that Salvadoran migrants aren't coming up in larger numbers uh, or aren't coming at all. That's what I meant to say, but um, they're certainly not coming in the same numbers as, say, uh, Guatemalan nationals, Tocos um, Rica, Mexico, um, or uh, Canada, uh, or the United States, for, for that matter. Um, so, you know, we would have seen that data. Uh, we would have included it. Um, certainly, the Salvadoran government is active in its own recruitment efforts um, to be able to vet and send workers to, uh, to the United States, as well as potentially to Canada. Uh, so they're certainly active. They're they're not uh, they're not they're not sitting on their hands uh, and and just simply letting the the Guatemalan and Honduran governments do this. Um, they're also actively involved. Thank you, Chris. And just to add a quick note there, uh, there is also a small number of Salvadoran migrants working in Mexico, and uh, also a small number of Salvadoran migrants working in Costa Rica. But I think uh, to to Chris's point, I think uh, the Guatemalan and Honduran migrants at this point are more visible, at least in these legal mechanisms. So, uh, Minister Rodriguez, could you again pick in up on that question about uh, other initiatives to potentially have multiple employers, <clears throat> excuse me, in the future for Guatemalan programs? And then also just anything you have uh, to add on bilateral programs with Belize or Mexico or, or even Costa Rica, what can you tell us about non-US uh, programs? Gracias. Thank you. And I may not have gotten the question about multiple employers. I don't know if I heard you correctly. The question is, the programs that we currently have I deal with a worker who arrives in U.S. or Canada and works with only one employer, but is there an ability to create more portability, allowing somebody once in Canada or the U.S. to have access to multiple employers? So working one season with one employer and then another and different one before returning home. I think that we've had to do that on an emergency basis to some extent. I'm thinking of a case in particular and that's because of the monitoring that we've been able to do with the uh, ministry. Certain work conditions were offered, and this was in the U.S. When the worker arrived, that was not, in fact, the conditions being offered, and so the workers didn't wish to remain there. The hard thing is moving somebody, getting a visa, putting in all that effort, and so we coordinated with the embassy, and we were able to place that worker in a different space within the same country that required a similar uh, profile from the worker. And so I understand that this is something that we wish to uh, get into, but there are some legal obstacles that could arise from this because the, the authorization is currently issued to one employer only for them to take in that foreign worker. And so it's not so much an issue on our end, but rather in the host country. And I'm as a ministry and as a program, we've been dealing more closely with the U.S. government. In the case of Mexico, there are a lot of cross-border migrants who are using the card that Mr. Ramos referred to at the beginning, or Senor Ramon. Uh, our goal is to regularize these processes and so that these cards can become easier or more feasible to obtain. Some people have them now, but we wish to regular, regularize um, these processes. A lot of people are continuing to migrate 
uh, ir through irregular channels, so without this card, so they don't go through inspection, they don't have the opportunity to earn the same wages. Even card holders, as we have found, uh, there are some points that we could improve so that they can be properly advised of their rights. That's in the case of Mexico, but it's my understanding that uh, we want, are going to also strengthen those points. The president is um, putting forth other initiatives, but uh, migration is a key issue on our bilateral agenda with Mexico. And something else that I would like to stress are the efforts that the US government has uh, made. And I know that the topic at hand today is Canada, Mexico, and Costa Rica, but our, or the country that takes in the most Guatemalans, as well as Hondurans and Salvadorans, irregularly, which is what we're trying to combat, is the United States. And so I think the United States should also streamline their internal procedures to facilitate regular migration. In the case of Canada, growth has happened very organically, as I said at the beginning. And so I have no doubt that now that this new regulation is going to take effect, as well as other measures that we've been taking as a government, that the volume of workers from us to Canada is going to grow. And part of the success that we've seen in Canada, it has to do with what Joe and Cristobal discussed, which is that um, it's been a growth through community ties, because references from people who have already worked are a pathway to getting into the program. And so that makes it more likely that people will work well and that will come back to their country or go back to the host country later. Uh, we sent some workers to a company in Alaska, Alaska this year in 2022. Uh, the request was for over 250 workers, strictly through references upon seeing how the Guatemalans at those countries were working very hard. And that gave rise to that. Thank you very much. We're running out of time. Mention one quick question for, for our colleague. Uh, Joe Martinez, uh, we have a question on, uh, on about Cierto, and the question is: How might the collaboration that Cierto is engaging in the household level at the household level in the country in the countries of origin be sustainable over time? Uh, so, uh, Joe, do you want to just maybe uh, have a minute or two to to answer that question, please? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I think one of the important focuses that helps us recognize that this is sustainable is. Uh, before Shifta was created, uh, I was working with the United Farm Workers and engaging networks of local community actors to better understand what were the different ways that migrants were, were traveling to uh, the United States or Canada. And this included me working in countries such as Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, um, El Salvador, uh, all the way to uh, Ecuador, Colombia, and Brazil. And one of the things that we recognize is that there always is going to exist some local community actor that's present within the communities of origin. And this has given the ability to not need to have a thousand Cierto employees. Um, it's the fact that we engage with these local actors that we're able to galvanize and quickly adhere to recruitment within various communities. Just like in Mexico, we've been able to establish contacts and networks within 10 different uh, states within regions to be able to conduct recruitment in a fast manner. And what this allows is that workers actually have folks that they trust within their communities to be able to talk to consistently and therefore taking the stranglehold that a recruiter can have on the access to information, to the ability to ensure that things are right. And by bringing a larger ecosystem into the picture, we allow this opportunity to grow at a much faster rate, not predicated on any one organization or individual. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. And and again, apologies to 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 the audience and to our panelists for not having uh, much time left over. I see a couple of questions here, and I'm going to take the liberty of just answering very bits and pieces of them. One of the questions is: is what occupations are are having the most gender disparity in Mexico and other countries? And what we found, even in Costa Rica as well as in Mexico, is that domestic work industries of domestic work have the ones that are most 
likely to be uh, woman or, or female uh, driven, and then construction or cultural work tends to be more male driven. This is something that I think all of us are aware needs to uh, continue to be a key component of our, of our awareness of how to expand channels for, for women in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Costa Rica. And I think there are some key pieces and recommendations that you can find in the report. The other question is actually about the report and where you can find it. You can please uh, look at the look for the report on our website. Uh, it will be uh, under publications, if not on the main page this afternoon, and also on social media. Um, and there are a few other um, um, questions here that will respond after the event directly to the the people that answered them or that asked them. But I want to make sure that we finish up here by thanking our panelists and making sure that they uh, uh, that they uh, have uh, an opportunity to. To, to continue to work with us and, and to answer your questions in the future. So again, thank you again. Apologies if we didn't answer your questions. Uh, we uh, didn't have as much time as, as, as we, we would want for this uh, opportunity, but I think this is a great start for the conversation. It's been really great to hear some refreshing perspectives from Joe um, and also from, from Minister Rodriguez, who I think are leading some of the best efforts in the region at this moment. Uh, there will be an audio and video recording available on our website uh, tomorrow. For any reporters on the call, please contact our Director of Communications, Michelle Middlestad at mmiddlestad at migrationpolicy.org. Again, that's mmiddlestad at migrationpolicy.org. Please check out our report. It is available in Spanish and in English on our website. The title is Temporary Worker Programs in Canada, Mexico, and Costa Rica, Promising Pathways for Ma Ma Managing Central American Migration. Um, again, please be in touch with us. It's been great to talk with you. Sorry again for the delay, but I do think this is the beginning of a, of a bigger and much longer conversation. So thank you all for participating, and I appreciate you joining. Have a great rest of your day.